Hello and welcome to Design Chat, the best live design discussion on the internet. I'm your host, Ryan McGovern, on Twitter. I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. Every week we get together with some of the coolest people from the design community and chat it up and talk about our problems, talk about the things we love about what we do, what we hate about what we do, and why we do it. So thank you guys all for showing up tonight. We are talking to Von Glitschka, the Von Glitschka, the draw designer, the illustrative designer, the mastermind who is going to teach us all of the secrets of the design world like I promised earlier on Facebook today. Um, so if <laughs> you don't have a pen, get one. You might want to. Vaughn, what's going on? Thanks for coming out. Golf clap. Uh, thanks for having me. This is pretty cool. I, I think it's pretty cool that somebody in uh, uh, England stayed up till 2 a.m. to listen to this, so... I better have something worth hearing. Yeah, we're <laughs> we're honored every time that happens, and you know, in just about every week, we get somebody from across the pond or or somewhere in the world where I definitely have not been. In. I have been to England, actually. I love England. Um, but all right, this is about you, Von Glitschka. This is about you, big man. Okay. Um. So for the people who um, may not be familiar with you or your work, um, give us a little brief history about how you got involved in what you do today. Uh, well, I've been doing this for approximately, this is my 24th year uh, working in the industry, and it's actually, I'm now going into my 10th year of uh, running my own studio. So, um, uh, for 15 years prior to basically starting my own, uh, my own studio, I worked for other companies, and some of those were small uh, boutique design firms, in-house art departments, and uh, one ad agency. So um, that's kind of where I cut my tooth in terms of design, and uh, they always would throw me the illustrated projects since I always was able to kind of do illustration, and um, that's kind of where I made all my mistakes. <laughs> so uh, when I started my own agent. I, I, actually, funny thing, I had an old boss come to me about this about four or five years ago, and he said, why didn't you do the kind of work that you're doing now for me when you work for me? And I said, well, I made all my mistakes. I made all my mistakes for you now so that when I'm in, on my own, I, I don't make those mistakes. So I think that's pretty common, but that, in a nutshell, that's kind of what I've done for the past 24 years. The past 10 years have been more specialized than the previous uh, time in my career just mm -hmm. because um, when I started my own firm, I thought I was going to be your traditional, like I was planning on building it up and taking in a partner at some point and getting employees, but um, it just didn't work out that way. It, it the, the niche I've kind of developed is more of a, I like to tell people I'm a hired creative gun you know they they hire me to uh, specifically create content for whatever given project they're working on and they bring me in to kind of partner mm -hmm. with them so that's why I enjoy doing um, just a note for the audience members if you haven't been here before you can ask questions um, we might catch them in the, in the chat room, but the more efficient way to do it is by clicking on the little I, uh, light bulb icon, and you can either type it in via text question, or if you've got a webcam, you can actually get on camera and ask a question face to face. I uh, highly recommend it. Seriously, you'll you'll get uh, amazing reaction out of it. Seriously, it, it's awesome. So please, please, please ask questions. We're gonna start taking those questions in just a little bit after we do a little bit of more interview here, and at the very end. Vaughn is going to ask a question of you guys, so get ready for that. I know Vaughn's been writing it for two days straight since I warned him. Uh, <laughs> I, I have been it. thinking of um, it. You have? Cool. Um, so yeah. let's talk a little bit more about what you're... So uh, you were talking about making mistakes early on in your career. A lot of people, when they're talking about, you know, right out of school, they're getting their first job, you know, they've got their uh, head full of, of all these very glorious notions of what, how they can change the world with design, and then they get that job, and they realize, damn, life is hard, jobs are hard, bosses can be very difficult, and maybe I made a mistake. Um, 
and, and your reality sort of comes crashing down. Um, what's your opinion on the, the sort of that sort of crash? Is that something that you experienced, and is that why some of those mistakes are being made? Um, yeah. Once again, I think that's that's pretty common as well. Um, I distinctly remember, and I'm going to try to remember the year. I believe it was around 1993 or 1994 is when I kind of had a, uh, for lack of a better terms, a, a design epiphany in terms of kind of stepping outside myself and observing my body of work at that time and what I was doing and where I was mm -hmm. headed and um, kind of asking the hard questions in terms of, is this really what I want to be doing? You know, and I remember that night going home and, and I felt like I, at that time I stuck in a dead end job. Um, I couldn't really progress any further in terms of a position because it was a small design firm. It's not like the owner is going to say, okay, you're the owner now, you know, I'll work for you. Um, so it was limited in terms of growth potential. And they really didn't have a vision for wanting to pursue into new areas. So the work actually became somewhat redundant and repetitive each year because we had the same accounts and the same type of projects mm -hmm. at the same time year in and year out and so uh, I, I really kind of had to take a look and kind of critique myself and when I did that I realized that on some levels I was phoning it in just because I didn't have that kind of that passion that a lot of art students have when they graduate you know, and th that's why I like talking to art students. It, 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 it's, it's nice to be around that kind of, um, that kind of hot, molten passion for what you want to do as a career. And right. um, I think the best, best way to facilitate that and to make sure you keep progressing and leveraging that is just to kind of be honest with yourself, I mean, I, I think it's important to get into a job and learn from the environment, whether or not it's in the beginning years exactly where you want to be headed, because we all need that general knowledge base, the foundation of understanding, you know, how a creative process happens, um, how to communicate with clients and, and how to, you know, read their expectations and hedge your approaches so that you're going to meet those expectations and deliver on target within a budget you know and when I did that for myself I realized yeah I kinda of understood all that stuff but then the other aspect of just creative and growing and, and kinda of challenging myself to try new things wasn't there and um, that's when I started looking for a new job and um, I was interviewed at the time I was interviewed by Adidas America up in Portland and they yeah. offered me an assi assistant creative uh, assistant art director's position for their men's apparel division and they like the interview went on for like three plus hours and my desk would have been like 50 feet away from this indoor basketball court. I could just walk from my desk and go shoot baskets, free tennis shoes, all these really cool fringe benefits. But um, when I went home and I just thought about it for a couple of days, I realized, yes, it's a cool environment, cool job, way better in terms of a title and stuff. But all I was doing was moving because where I was at at the time, we did a lot of sports uh, wear design, a lot of apparel graphics. It wasn't; a, uh -huh. it was a design studio, but that made up a large majority of the work we did. And I just didn't want to stay within that, and so I turned down the job from Adidas. And for about a year, I kept working at this design studio, just thinking, "Okay, was I a complete idiot for turning that job down?" Should and it's like <laughs> self doubt the whole time. And then it yeah. was about a year later. Um, my and keep in mind, this was before email and before the internet, really. Um, 
as what right. we know it to be right now. Um, right. And at that time, I got a letter from my brother, and he lived in San Diego, and it was just an envelope shoved with a bunch of classified ads shoved in it. And I had talked to him one night and told him where I was at and what I was thinking. And my brother yeah. is a CPA, and one of his clients was a designer and an illustrator down the San Diego area. And he said, you should do what this guy does. And I go, what does he do? Well, he just works on his own and yada, yada. And I go, well, that's easy to say. It's another thing to do. And he goes, right. And right. He, probably violate, he probably violated that, that client uh, confidentiality with me because he said, this dude makes this much money and you could make this much money. And I go, <laughs> I, and I was like, he makes how much? And he told me and... I go, what's his name? He gave me his name, and I looked it up in, um, I want to say workbook, but it might have been another annual. And I looked up his page, and he did good work, but I was just blown away that I felt like, wow, I got the inside information on this guy. And that kind of opened up me to, to say, okay, I just need to leave my comfort zone, even if I don't completely know what's going to be next. And so I told my brother, I go, well, I'd consider anything at this point. So he mailed me all these classified ads that he saw in the local paper down there. And one of them was for a company called Upper Deck. They make sports collectibles and trading cards and yeah. all that kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff. Now, when I was growing up, I collected sports cards. I, I was a big collector of baseball and football, basketball. And when I was looking at the classified, I'm going, what? I go, sports cards? I go, no, that's not the type of job I want. And that night, my wife uh, said, can you go to the store, pick up some milk? So I go down there, and I swing into where the magazine section is. Because I remember from growing up, and this was like 12 years prior to that, um, I used to buy mm -hmm. um, these, these card catalogs called... I think it's called Beckman's or something like that, and it lists all the card prices. Right. And that used to right, that exactly. used to be nothing. It used to be on par print wise with like an auto trader. We're not talking high quality print job. Well, that's what I was looking for, and I couldn't find it. And then all of a sudden, I see this like primo looking full color magazine, and it's that publication. So they had gone from like this cheapy, you know auto trader newspaper print to glossy full color magazine with with articles and catalog listings and then on the back of that mm -hmm. was a full page was a full page ad for upper deck and they were showing this latest like i think it was nfl this card they did and it had holographics and foil and die cutting and i'm like holy cow trading cards of like drastically <laughs> changed because all i was thinking is big deal four color printing on one side you know uh two colors on yeah. the back you know and how creative can it be you know uh when right. i saw that it changed my mind and i sent i sent off some sample oh i sent in my resume i got a call back about a week and a half later uh from the company uh, long story short they they flew me down there now I, I to interview for the job. Now, I didn't want to kind of give away the fact I was looking for a job. So I went into work. Mm -hmm. this, this, is the, this is the funny part. I went into work on a Thursday, and I said I need to get off at 3 o'clock. And then as soon as I got off at 3 o'clock, I drove up to Portland, jumped on the plane, flew down to California, uh, to San Diego area. My brother picked me up. He drove me to Upper Deck. I got there about a half an hour late for the interview. It, so at the time, it's about 5, 5.45 p.m. at night. And I walk in, uh -huh. Uh -huh. literally, I'm, wear, I'm, wear, I'm wearing a T-shirt, shorts, sandals, <laughs> and I don't even, I don't, my, port, this, my portfolio consisted of a, just a, a manila folder with color printouts just shoved in it. That's all I had. And I walked in there. <laughs> inter I, I walked into the job, interviewed, and he offered me the job. And I was like, okay, I'll take it. And um, 
it, it, the whole thing was kind of surreal. It just happened so fast, and I, I, I think about it now, and I just I can't believe he even offered me that job. I mean, I, I was so unprofessional in every aspect of that interview in terms of how I was dressed, and I showed up late, and my portfolio was hardly professional at all. Um, yeah, was, and so that's kind of where the catalyst happened for me personally. That's where I really realized, um, well, basically, I went from a little, uh, a little design studio where I was doing these little projects for these little clients to... I get, I go to Upper Deck, and they hand me over the launch of a multi-million-dollar project, and I'm responsible for, for basically the entire branding and identity of it. And I wow. learned a lot in that job from a, a marketing standpoint, and from, um, you know, designing for a target audience, and just the whole retail experience was really good. You brought up about five subjects in there that I want to hit on um, and we can spend the rest of the discussion just talking about those things. Um, the first one I want to talk about is is knowing your worth. You, you were saying near the beginning it was a surprise to hear how much this other designer who's working in a, in a, you know, a very professional capacity w was taking in and it's something that young designers are very not aware of. People who are in your position who have a secure job but are, are unhappy and, and scared about going out on their own, know very little about. Um, and, and you know there are big fears there about knowing exactly what you do, what you, what, what you do is worth, and how to charge for it, and how to be compensated for your professional knowledge of our industry. Um, what was the biggest turning point for you other than that one moment of, of you know, uh, understanding your value and being able to charge for it and figuring that part out for yourself. Um, probably, and I, I've shared this quite a few times with people who kind of ask me this question is back in, two th I started my own business in 2002, but back in 2003, a designer friend of mine by the name of Paul Howalt, um works for Tactic Creative in um, Arizona. He invited me to go to a conference with him in Philadelphia, which is, it was based on illustration. It's called Icon. And so I went to it and I met another designer slash illustrator there by the name of Craig Frazier. And um, when I was looking at some of his work, um, there's a lot of it that I saw that it, within uh, the book he had published at that time, that I hadn't seen anywhere else, and I and and so I had asked him, well, what, you know, what what about this work? What did you do that? Who did you do that for? And he goes, I just did that for myself. And I go, you just just for the heck of it. And he looks at me and he goes, well, you have to realize you get the work you show. And he goes, if you just sit yeah. around and wait for somebody to hire you to do something that you want to do, it may never happen. So I decided to show them what I could do because that's what I want to do. And he goes, you get the work you show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that really kind of resonated with me. And it's proven to be so true. And... Um, it, it's like if, if, for instance, if you like designing uh, logos, then then start developing logos. Even if it's for a small business locally, just start creating logos right. for uh, pe people right. who need it. You know, don't turn the job down because they can't afford to pay you the same that Landor Associates might pay you for some big national brand. That's not the point. Um, just just start showing the type of work you want to do. Don't wait for somebody to hire you. Just, um, you know, and I think that kind of goes hand in hand with that passion thing because um, I'm not going to do it if I'm not passionate about it. And so there's side projects right. that I'm always working on because it's, I can't help but be creative. It's just part of me. And um, I need that kind of release valve because not all of my paid projects um, allow me that gratification. And I think it's important for a designer and an illustrator, for that matter, 
um, to have that too, as well as, you know, you have to pay your bills and do that kind of work, but um, it's important to feel like you're also doing other things that you want and feel like you should do. Um, the second subject from our first part uh, tonight that I want to hit on is, is this idea about people who have preconceived, even, and even creatives, who have preconceived notions about what um, the outcome of a job should be or what a brand specifically looks like. Um, you, you were giving the example of, uh, of the Trader magazine, the Car Trader magazine, and what you knew of it before. Um, and the idea of working on that job was, you know, what, it wasn't ranking very high for you. But then you saw the possibilities of what it could be, what it could turn into, and it completely smashed your expectation of, of what that kind of job might be, right? Um, so my question to you is, you know, as designers, we struggle with trying to um, get other people to see what we see as potential, you know, and, and what's the best way to approach that problem when, when you realize you, the client that you're working with or for or collaboratively isn't seeing the potential in what you see. Um, what are some methods that you go about to, to get an idea running like that? Um, reverse psychology. <laughs> uh, seriously though. For real? Like straight I, up? I mean, I, I'm being a little flippant by saying that, but in a certain respect, yeah. Um, it's all about trying to get them to buy into the the vision you have for where they could go. So, yeah, I do all the upfront work with a client. Like, I have them fill out a creative brief, and I've designed some of those questions so they will reveal certain things. And then I take that, and I follow it up with more questions um, if, if it sparks certain ideas in my mind. And then... Um, but I also tell them, I go, look, th this is your opportunity to be part of the creative process. I'm not going to let you sit there and look over my shoulder and tell me how to move things around. But um, for you to be involved in this, this is where it's going to be most important. I need you to think through these things and think about your mm -hmm. company from a, a, diff a different point of view. Also, I think it's important to tell them, you know, it's important for you as the owner of the company to realize that your personal taste might not be uh, what the audience needs. So I might come up with mm -hmm. an idea that's appropriate for your audience, but technically you might not personally like that aesthetic, but, and you have to be able to um, be okay with that and, and use the final measuring factor as your audience, not your personal taste. And that's hard for right. a lot of entre a lot of especially if it's a startup or they're entrepreneurs where they've relied on their their own insights and stuff to get where they're at and then all of a sudden some designer who's never started a multi-million dollar startup is telling them that they need to kind of ignore that and and think about it from a different way. And it's always a balance. I'm not mm -hmm. saying they, yeah. they don't have valid input on stuff, but it's all about trying to get them to see it in a, in a, in a different light. Um, they tend to be goal-oriented, and so a lot of their, their vision is based off of, well, we need this so we can get here. And I, I try right. to break out of that and get, get them to think in a, in a slightly different way. Now, it obviously doesn't work um, all the time. Um, I basically, basically why I was late today is because about three hours of my time this morning was basically just uh, fielding questions from a client of mine who uh, basically didn't like anything I did, even though I thought everything was com completely appropriate and on target. Um, they just felt like it was frustrating. Let's put it. It's the kind of situation where, as a designer, you go, you know what? I suck. You know, you get in that Stuart Smalley kind of mindset where you go, <laughs> I, I suck. I suck. Nobody likes me. I can't draw today. Uh, why am I, I? I should just go work in the hotel industry. You know, I need to change my job. And uh, I was feeling pretty crappy this morning, to be honest with you. 
Well, how lucky for us that that happened to you today, and it's completely fresh in your mind, <laughs> uh, and and, yes. and and you can vent and, and relate to the rest of the design community tonight. And we can lift you back up because there, you know, there's plenty of design inspiration to go around, right? So, um, was was part of the result of your feeling that way um, because you went into the meeting. Um, with the notion that um, everything that you did is, is fantastic. You kind of mentioned that going into it, you thought that the work was good and appropriate. No, what, what really set me off is instead of, instead of like validating his points, um, they were all kind of like backhanded compliments. Like, I really think you're a great designer, uh, but, and then he'd make some snarky comment about like one of the directions. I go, okay, I, I get that you don't like them, but you don't have to sit there and you know, point them out like they're my ugly children. You know what I mean? And that was kind of, it, it's, it's one thing to say, none of these are working. You know, I don't like the directions you're taking. It's another thing to compare one of them to, well, this looks like you did it in your sleep. It's like, you know, I, that's not constructive. That's not going to, that's not helping yeah, my attitude yeah. when you say that, dude. It just makes me want to, you know, it just makes me want to start making fun of you being clueless. So. <laughs> and that's, you know, this is a real situation. This happens. Relationships com completely break down beca because of situations like this and, and where, you know, sometimes working relationships can go sour and maybe it's a better not idea not to work to each other. Or sometimes it's just a bad day, right? Maybe that guy had something that went wrong in his morning. Somebody kicked his shin and he decided he's going to pass on the buck and, and make your day bad, right? And you never know when that's coming. There's no way to anticipate it yeah. at all. Yeah, that, that could very um, well so be the point. 2002, uh, you founded Glitchka Studios. Um, I didn't mention that URL, sorry about that earlier, von, uh, von Glitschka.com. Von but somewhere along the way, um, you started putting together books, and you've also got vonsterbooks.com uh, with its great series uh, of instructional and inspirational uh, messages. Um, tell us a little bit about that, how that started, where along the way did it happen, um, where did you decide to, wow, this, you know, the ideas in my head need to go into printed material and I want to give them to people. Where did that happen? Well, uh, this goes back before Twitter, before Facebook. Um, the first type of quote-unquote social media was uh, design forums online. And so I used to frequent um, uh, communication arts design forum and uh, how designs design forum and within mm -hmm. how's forums some uh, one of their editors for how books had posted a thread about what kind of design books would you like to see and um, one thing I talk about in one of my uh, session my presentations I give is all about harvesting your ideas and having a system in place so when you have an idea or you see a visual or you hear something um, you kind of capture it and you you can archive it so you can refer to it later or go through it later uh, in terms of inspiration and one of the things I do is I have and it's just a text file that I keep on my machine so anytime some idea pops into my head regarding a publication uh, or a book I'll just open up that text file and just type out a one or two sentence description just to kind of save that idea um, so I don't lose it. And mm -hmm. so I started doing that I started doing that years ago and when this lady posted um, this thread on the How forum, I just kind of copied and pasted some of my ideas and posted it on the thread and she contacted me about three days later and said, um, I like two of these ideas. Do you think you could write up a proposal for each? And she told me what I need to do, and I did it. And uh, they went for one of the books. So that's how that all started. Wow. You were fished. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome, because you took the bait, and, and it turned out to be tasty, and they didn't rip a hole in your mouth, right? 
yeah, uh, Hal Books has been great. It's uh, they basically they agree to whatever the book. I, my next book's coming out in August, and it, it'll be a. Uh, it's more of a. It's the books I do for Hal are what I consider art resource books. Um, the first one was textures. The second one was illustrated patterns, and the third one I put mm -hmm. together is a book is a book of ornaments and flourishes and border treatments and all that kind of stuff. So I spent about a year working on the art. So there's about 600 plus pieces of art in the book. So what kind of response uh, do you get out of these books? Do, do people write you? Do you have to do like a book tour? Do, do people write you after using them? Thank you for, for teaching them how to get started or, you know, anything like that? Well, don't get me wrong. I, I love doing books, but um, th th there really is no Grisham when it comes to design books. You know, there there are no, uh, I, I, I guess the closest you could get is Bill Gardner with Logo Lounge. I mean, that's become, that's the all-time best-selling design book and series, and it's for good reason yeah, because... Yeah. Oh, most 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 designers love logos, but um, my books within the context of the design industry um, have been considered good sellers, you know. But as compared to other industries, it's like next to nothing. My book that comes out in August with ornaments, um, a lot of friends that I have in the industry, I've given access to kind of that archive before it's published um, so when it comes out I can show some real world examples of how it was used and I just want to show something my friend uh, Vincent sent me he works he now works at uh, Tops, the trading Ooh, card company. Look at that. That's awesome. So this is a tin that he designed um, that's there you go that's a trading card set but he used my ornaments here and up in the corners and the border and stuff so it's really cool so that's the kind of that that's what I create those books for is so um, designers who want you know quality artwork without using the same thing that five million other designers have used to you know uh, uh, Dover books you know will have a, a resource for that there was there was a blog post that you made um, maybe a couple weeks ago where you, you, you called it making a point and you had started the post by talking about how meticulous your process is and sometimes people don't understand why your, your process is so meticulous, right? Um, and one of the comments you got back on, on something was, uh, aren't computers supposed to do the work for us? Um, and that really got under your skin, <laughs> right? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that, well, it, it was somebody who, and, and I'll just say up front, there, this person is a bad person. They're really nice. They were just a little frustrated. Um, they had bought my book and they liked it, but they sent me a question about it saying, isn't there anything that you can buy to plug into Illustrator that would do this for you? And what, what they meant mm -hmm. by do it for you was, couldn't you just run your drawing through some filter and illustrator and it would automatically build stuff and I said well that's kind of what auto trace really is but it's and they said well I know that but you know something that will do it like you do it manually but it does it for you and I was just like you know that's the craftsmanship part of what we do you know we may use I like to say we, we work in a digital age, but ideas are still best developed in analog form. But even though they're digital mm -hmm. tools, it still takes, you know, kind of analog knowledge and craftsmanship to leverage those tools um, precisely. So, yeah, there are certain things that it will simplify, but it, it's it's still a lot of hard work to to work out a graphic or a design in order for it to, you know, be elegant, in order for it to just be a good idea. I've seen a lot of weak concepts rendered really well, but then I've seen a lot of really great concepts uh, rendered poorly. So the balance is to do both well. 
and they were just trying right. to find a kind of a cereal box answer to the graphic universe there, and I couldn't give it to them. It's this weird 1950s notion that one day computers will do everything and, and we won't have to do anything ourselves. The burden will be lifted um, and everything will be beautiful and we will live harmoniously because computers are so perfect they'll figure it out, right? Um, but, you know, there's a filter, a, a, a look at how crazy powerful the computers we have are today insanely powerful computers that that any of us can buy right they're like supercomputers super compared to anything that existed 20 years ago um no filter no uh the vector translation tool will ever make the perfect curve will ever make the perfectly balanced um shape you know i mean squares you know mathematically perfect shapes fine but true, like human touched inspiration, it's just not there. It's not. I don't. I don't think it's possible, no matter how fast or how strong these computers get, or how good we program them. Yeah, I, I think there is always the danger of of things looking too perfect and too clean. If that's, I don't know if that's the right way to word it, but you know, that's why I like mm -hmm. textures. You know, it, it's things that. It, Computer stuff can look too. I, I love Starbucks aesthetic just because it's it looks hand done. Although all of it is done digitally, I think that they're they're the best example I know of to just point at and say, you know, that's a good way to handle things. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to talk a little bit about. Um, we just recently had Justin Aaron's. Uh, Rule 29 on um, a friend of yours. You just recently spoke with him at an event. Um, and also, you were involved in one of the projects we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, this is My Normal. Uh, it's a new film documentary about um, the, the slums in Africa. Um, and, and you were a part of that. And I believe you traveled with him. Um, and you also you did the, the type for the poster. Tell us about your experience with that and how you got involved in it. Oh, wow. That was, uh, Justin's an awesome guy. Um, I first met him yeah. back in, uh, 2007 and, uh, we've been really good friends ever since. And back in 2009, uh, we were hanging out at the how design conference in Austin and he brought with him a book he put together on, uh, the work that one of his clients, which is, a uh, NGO called Life in Abundance. Um, they work in um, Ethiopia in the slums there too. And so he had published the des design and laid out this really nice book um, that's documenting that whole process. And they had just finished shooting their first documentary there. And so he's just sharing with me all the work they had done and what they were working on at that time. And then he started talking about the next one they're going to do in um, uh, Nairobi. And he just looked at me and he said, you should come with us. And I was just like, I, I didn't even give it a second thought. I was like, okay. And um, come to find out later when he called, he called me about four months later and said, so are you still interested? Thinking that I'd go, oh, no, I'm not interested. I said, yeah, I'm interested. And he goes, you know, and he told me that he, I was like one of the first people to ever just like not back out later, you know, and uh, right. not, not the, I'm not saying that to like pat myself on the back or something, but um, I, I just love what he is doing and I just wanted to be part of it. And so I was part of a crew of 10 people. We went over to Nairobi and for two weeks, uh, about 12 days, actually, we, uh, we shot this documentary in the slums around Nairobi, um, the Mathari slums, and one of the other slums, which the name is escaping me at the moment. But it was, it, I mean, this sounds like really uh, predictable and trite by saying this, but it, it truly was a life-changing experience for me. I mean, I had never... Um, kind of stepped out of my normal into somebody else's normal and really kind of look at 
life in general from uh, that kind of perspective. And it was, mm -hmm. it was awesome. It was, it truly was. It was a really great experience. Um, one of the things I did there that isn't in the film um, is one day I went to this uh, little field that's right by the slums and I took about 50 or 60 kids and I brought with me all these pens and a bunch of drawing pads and then I just started handing them out to all the kids and all these kids started drawing and I just said draw whatever you want and some of them didn't know what to draw so I'd say you know draw a dog or, or draw this and they would take off go sit down and so all these kids were drawn pictures and that was just that was a lot of fun so uh, but the the most important thing um, from that whole experience was you know getting the footage needed to put the documentary together and uh, Justin mm -hmm. who's art director um, who's basically the creative director of the project and Brian McDonald, who's the chief photographer and director of the film, uh, they've done a great job. And Bob, um, also as uh, the producer, they, they edited together a great film. And Justin let me create all the linear type that's animated in the film. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited about going to the premiere next week. Me and my wife are flying to Chicago for the premiere, mm -hmm. so... Uh, that's going to be great. April so if, 7th, if uh, anybody wants... It... No, it's okay. Go ahead. April 7th, uh, the Arcadia Theater. If you're anywhere around the Chicagoland area, it's in St. Charles, Illinois, uh, the Arcadia Theater. Um, you can find information about it at thisismynormal.com. That's through the Life, uh, Life in, Ab in Abundance. Um, somebody look up their uh, website real quick, Life in Abundance, if you want to learn more about it. Um, or perhaps even donate, um, that's probably the place to go. So yeah, very exciting that you, know, you were able to be a part of that and, and help bring that vision, bring that, bring that story uh, to, to the rest of us to, to raise awareness about the type of help that that, um, that, that group needs specifically in Nairobi. Um, so really just awesome to see. And um, um, it looks like we're going to be able to make that premiere. So uh, looking forward to meet you. I'm definitely going to come out. Um, awesome. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, hanging out with Justin and everybody, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a good time, no doubt. Let's let's start doing uh, let's start doing questions. We're at the end of the night. We're gonna we're gonna fly through these really quick. If you've got a, a, a webcam, please ask a video question. Get on. Uh, uh, really, really, really take advantage of that um, because where else can you do this? This is amazing. Um, first question from tonight uh, comes from Mitch Smith, who asks if you could peek into any designer slash illustrator sketchbook. Whose would you choose, and why them? Same question. No. Wow, that's a that's a great question. Um, actually, it probably wouldn't be a designer or an illustrator. If I could look in anybody's sketchbook, it would probably be uh, a movie director. And man, that's hard to narrow it down to one person. Um, I, I personally, I really like Ridley Scott. I, I like his work. He has such a diverse range in his portfolio. Um, the other person would probably have to be the, the probably the Cullen brothers. You know, I, they're, <laughs> I've probably watched, um, uh, I've probably watched their films more than any other over the last five years more than any other uh, movie production company. Um, I, I, the Big Lebowski, I think I must have watched that about 20 times in December and January for whatever reason. It's just <laughs> I, every night I'd start it and I, there's so many great lines in that movie. It's funny. So probably it would probably be, um, if I had to pick one, I'd say the Cullen brothers, just because they do have an art background. So, um, and my, they tend to be, and there's certain directors that will storyboard out a whole script before they, they start shooting it, and the, and that's what they do. That's the creative process they use. Uh, some, uh, some directors don't do that. Um, so, I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, other than that. If it was an analog designer or something, um, 
Bill Bill Gardner from Logo Lounge. I'd love to see what his sketchbook looks like. I guess. Um, I know the question was was uh, directed to you, but for me, I'd like to see the notebook or like diary of somebody like Buzz Aldrin, like just having like landed on the moon and, and knowing what he knows and seeing what he sees. I think that'd be pretty special and amazing. That, that's true. Uh, uh, next question comes from Gary Holmes, um, who wants to know, Vaughn, have you ever been completely stumped on a creative project? Uh, never, right? You just, you know what to do every single time. Yep, never. Nope, just you. That's only your problem. Nobody struggles with that. So. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like... Uh, there, there. I, I swear, there's days my drawing skills decide to. They're still on the weekend schedule. I'll show up Monday and I'll. I'll it's like I have a deadline due, and for the life of me, I can't. I can't work out the idea. Um, what What helps me is to leave my studio and to go somewhere that has nothing to do with my studio, and that tends to kind of break through those barriers so mm -hmm. it's all about knowing what environment you can work through ideas best and for me I have to do it off-site I can't do concept work in my studio where I create I don't know why it's just I do better job if I head down to a local coffee shop and just work out my thumbnails there so mm -hmm. um, we've got one from John Beatty who wants to know Vaughn what do you think is your best logo slash identity design ever? I added the ever for dramatic effect. Uh, that that's like a case to case basis. Usually, it's my the latest one I've worked on that I like. You know, I mean, right <laughs> now the what, my favorite one, the one that I've worked on recently that I really liked. Um, but the friend I created it for because I'm a nice guy and he hated it. It's like, is the skull one that's on my blog right now. So if you go to designer, you can see the, uh, what's it, what I call it? Oh, just hot rod. And it's just an engine skull head type thing. Um, I agreed to help a designer friend of mine who's starting a beer brand and I created that for him in he didn't like it, so I said, fine, I like it, and I kept it and <laughs> repurposed it for my own. That, right now, that's my favorite design, but um, that's always changing. I get, I kind of get sick of my work after a while, so that's part of my motivation to keep doing new work is because, um, you know, I get tired of what I've already done. There, there's a project that I haven't worked on for like three weeks that I'm dying to get back on because... It's so fun, but, you know, it's not going to pay the bills, so I can't jump on it until I have some open time. Right. I think there's a predictable, scientifically predictable line of, of how much a creative person likes or dislikes their project um, as, as they're, they become aware of it, agree to do it, um, and then it sort of does this all the way up to as they are finishing it, they love it and they're pitching it. Um, and it's the most amazing thing they've ever done. And then there's, after the meeting, there's a, a big drop down, drop down of, oh, what did I do? I'm not sure. I can't believe I presented that. I could have done so much more. Um, and, and then you're down in the dumps for a while. And sometimes you put it away and you come back to it and you pull out of a drawer two weeks later, a year later, and it goes back up again. And it wasn't so bad. And it was okay, <laughs> but maybe you could have done a couple of things. I think this happens to everybody, no? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think you can stare at something too long. That's and that's probably why designers have such a hard time working on stuff for themselves is because it's not confined within a, a parameter or a, or a timeline or a deadline, and so it languishes. Well, the more it languishes, the more we get tired of looking at it, and it's mm -hmm. it's harder to be. It, we can either be overcritical or um, we can just get to the point where we're complacent with that's eh, it's okay and we just go with it so it can work both ways negative or positive but I think that's that's why it's hard to be your own client 
Um, we've got a video call. Uh, we, we haven't uh, tested the connection yet, but he's been on before. Paul Stonier. Let's bring him on and see, uh, see if we can get him on. Hello. From Upper State, New York, Paul Stonier. What is going on, my man? Good to see you. Hey, hey. Doing well. Doing What's your well, question, buddy? Uh, probably to start off, with, um, just want to comment real quick, too, that, uh, Vaughn, your comment on having to, to leave the studio and go to, like, a coffee shop to, uh, to, to work on concepts is absolutely relatable. I think I, I don't know if I have to do that every time, but that definitely helps. Um, but my question is, why do you do what you do? There's got to be something that uh, kind of makes you get up every morning for 24 years and keep cranking out. Good work. Um, because I could never... Th th there's a lot of times I'll, like... I'll go see the doctor or I'll go somewhere and I'll see somebody, well, just today I was driving around, I had to go to the print shop to pick up some proofs today and on my way there, right across the street, there was like the street crew and there's like 14 of them and I just remember the thought popped through my head that, man, I'd I, I wouldn't want to do that job for a living, you know, but I, I'm glad there's people that that like to do stuff like that or, or are dedicated to do things like that because um, I, I, I don't know if I could. I always wonder if I was born like in the 1700s, what, what, what would I do? Because it's not like they had designers and, you know, I'm not a fine artist, so I don't paint. So um, what are the answers that you've come up with? What would yeah. you do in the 1700s? <laughs> I, I'd probably be a sign shop guy, I guess, you know, create, you know, mercantile <laughs> or whatever it was outside the, um, so I guess what drives me is just, um, I, I just like to create, I guess that's what it comes down to. I've always, even when I was a kid, you know, I'd get toys for Christmas and like two months later I'd have them pulled apart, seeing how they worked and, um, you know, pulling the little motors out of it and hooking it up to a battery and doing other things with it so it's always fun to create stuff so I guess it's the whole idea of um, creating that I enjoy and what kind of drives me Thanks cool Thanks. Thanks for asking the question Paul thanks for coming yeah. on man Thanks Paul Got another question here from Gary Holmes the great uh, Garific at Garific on Twitter uh, Vaughn, what are your thoughts on trendy logos? Lots of colors, very busy, as seen in Logo Lounge. <laughs> um, well, I, I kind of would take Bill Gardner's um, philosophy on this, because um, I asked him the same thing when I interviewed him about three years ago on an old podcast I used to do, and his, his comment was good. Um, he made the comment that we live in what he calls an RGB world. And because of that, a lot of the old methodologies that were tried and true and were there for a reason back during, you know, like the Saul Bass days or, or, or Rand, uh, whoever the designer of choice is, um, they're somewhat antiquated now. They don't really apply for the same reasons they were established to begin with, such as the, the well, the logo needs to work in black and white first before you do anything with color. Well, in my opinion, that's a little absurd because we live in an age now digitally where anything can be reproduced pretty much anywhere. So the idea that, well, if it doesn't work in black and white, then you're going to run into problems. Well, yeah, that was a big deal back in the 50s and 60s where reproduction methods were, uh, weren't that great, weren't that refined, weren't that precision, and they weren't digital. So uh, you needed that base standard that you could then build upon knowing that it was going to reproduce accurately in all the various forms. Uh, we don't have to worry about that now, so um, I don't think it's appropriate to kind of throttle your creativity to stay within that that mindset and that approach. Now I know there's going. This is going to be like kicking a hornet's nest in terms of the design industry because there's a lot kick of designers it, who it. 
will take it. <laughs> well, they'll take a pretty hard stance on this and say, oh, you couldn't be further from the truth. That's so wrong and yada, yada. And they'll pull up all their proof text to prove it wrong or whatever. It's like, that's fine, you know. But um, it doesn't change the fact that that digital is what digital is and it makes reproduction a lot easier. Now, you have to balance that with with some common sense and the best example I would use to show what you probably wouldn't want to do is the Verizon logo. I mean the Verizon logo <laughs> is just a glorified, I mean it looks like a sign shop designed it to begin with but yeah. it has a gradation in it. Well if you've ever seen that logo implemented on a cell phone even it doesn't look that hot. The gradation doesn't look that great and so I think that's an example of okay, knowing that it was for that target market and those kind of devices, you know, they probably should have thought through that a little better. You know, Apple doesn't have that problem with their logo when they put it on all their devices, mm -hmm. and I would venture to bet it's because they've thought through all that. And so I think that's the most important aspect. If, if you're developing for a client and their, the totality of their existence is online, then, you know, it doesn't matter if they have a black and white to send faxes with. You know, it, it's, it's kind of, it, you're putting unrealistic limitations on the project when you do that. So it's all about knowing the audience, knowing the usage. And um, that said, I always try to design a black and white logo for every piece of artwork. But if you put that next to the, the color one, you looked at both, um, there's going to be some differences just because it's black and white. So I think it's a balance. I don't well, think a, you can wholesalely say anything yeah. one way or the other. That's a great subject to bring up. In, um, how about this? Um, so the people listening live right now and the people listening to the podcast afterwards, this is an experiment that can uh, go on for years. Somebody may discover this podcast five years from now and act on what I'm about to say. Reimagine today's Verizon uh, logo. Um, everybody knows it totally sucks and doesn't apply you know, to the nature of branding that we have today. Um, re rethink it, and when you do it and, and you, you design something, post it on the internet, uh, on Twitter with a hashtag new Verizon and copy at Von Glitschka on it. So he, so he can, or at Vonster. <laughs> On Twitter, um, so Thank so you. for years from now, you're going to be receiving um, re redesigned um, Verizon logos. And on that note, on that note, um, the power of Twitter. Uh, <laughs> last week, was it last week? Oh, man, it seems so much longer ago. Um, I, I don't remember how it came up in conversation, but somebody brought up uh, Gary Huskwit. He's the director of Objectified and Helvetica and, and a new movie on on um, city planning. And I, I mentioned that we, we've been trying to get him on the show for a little while, and we haven't been successful. So then live on the show, I suggested that everybody Twitter bomb him right now. At Gary underscore Hustwit, uh, please join Design Chat. And after less than, less than 24 hours, publicly he said, okay, 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 it was, uh, I'll do it. Uh, I can't do it now, but at the end of the summer. So uh, it worked. It worked. We're going to have Gary Hustwit on the show. Uh, thank you to everybody who participated cool. in that. I'm sorry to Gary Hustwit for twit bombing you, but that's how it had to happen. So he said at the end of the summer he's going to be on, so, so look forward to that. Um, uh, but on that note, I'm going to start wrapping up the show. Uh, a couple thank yous I want to get out of the way really quick, um, or actually announcements. Uh, Bright, Bright Great is a studio in Chicago. They're going to be on in two weeks. After the week after that is going to be uh, Carolina Di Bartolo. She just wrote a book about typography uh, with Eric Speakerman, and, and they've got a great um, online representation of that. Look it up. It's very awesome. Next week is open. We don't have anybody scheduled yet. So if you've got a suggestion or you know somebody can come on or you yourself want to come on and be a guest, please contact me on Twitter at Hoopajoob or at Design Chat. I want to thank Symbolic. We're broadcasting from their offices right now in West Lundy, Illinois. Great agency, great small group here, smbolic.com. Um, they also put on the CUSP conference, which is coming up in September. And there's open registration right now, so look for that. Um, and those are my thank yous. Uh, other than uh, Von Glitschka, thank you for spending time with us tonight and hanging out. Really, 
Uh, the, the audience loved Thanks. it. They were, they were chatting the whole time and really just great advice all around. And it was a pleasure spending some time with you. No problem. Thank you. Appreciate it. Looking forward to all the great stuff that you're doing. Um, Becoming a Hired Gun, it says on your website, is a, a talk in development. When's it, have you given that talk yet? Is that coming out? Um, I'll be doing that at the How Design Conference. Awesome. And that's in Chicago this year. Awesome. Very cool. Well, congratulations yep. on everything. Um, looking forward to seeing everything in the future. And everybody check them out, vonglitschka.com. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> Happy design chatting. Uh, oh, wait. We'll see you next week, hopefully, with, uh, with another guest. What? Oh, your question. Uh, you remembered. My question. You didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask your question to the audience. Uh, okay, so this is how this works. You can either answer the question in the chat room, or uh, if, if you really want to broadcast your answer, type it in as a text question. We'll pop it up on the screen. So, Vaughn, what is your question to the design chat community? Okay, well, I, I was thinking about this earlier today, and my question is, if, if as a designer, if you had the opportunity to change anything you wanted graphically as it's related to the United States in terms of the government, um, what would that be? Ooh. Graphically. So this is going to be hard to focus on this question because there's so many things we'd like to change about the government itself. But specifically, graphically, what would you change about, about the government? Okay. The money, the tax forms. Oh, good call. <laughs> We've got a couple. Uh, money and other stuff from Herson Rodriguez. Uh, Gary Holmes, uh, redesign currency. It's green and ugly. What's wrong with green? I like green. Cash is green. I don't know if that's going to change. Slight variations of color, I can take it, but cash is green. The websites, the government websites. Okay, I got you there. Yeah. Yeah. Nick's the Eagles. Andrew Tibbetts, who helps us out with the show and employee symbolic here, doesn't like Eagles, apparently. Souls, they're souls. I like UK money. Become rainbowed. Ooh, rainbow, uh, rainbow currency. I, I could buy that. I could buy that. Swiss money? Who's like Swiss money? All good answers here. The flag. Er, do we change the flag? What are the consequences <laughs> of changing the flag today? What I mean, uh, you know, having all its symbolism based in the, the roots of how the country started um, and how much pride and think about all the people who take pride in that flag. What are the repercussions of possibly redesigning the United States flag today? Well, have you heard of the design conspiracy behind the flag? I have not. OK, uh, well, the, from what I've heard, this is how it goes. Puerto Rico is technically another state but they've never officially made it one because they didn't know how to redesign the flag so it works good the whole reason for not making puerto rico a state is is the, visually the flag is holding it up that that that's what i've heard that's what i heard i read that so <laughs> i don't know you know i have i have it's to probably a design right conspiracy on, um, but sure it could be uh, earlier, I threw in a little comment about Buzz Aldrin and, and my fascination with him. And that was completely uh, seeded by the Justin Aarons, <laughs> who told me to do so uh, because of your conspiracy He's theories. He's a sucker, about man. The United States <laughs> landing on the moon. But you didn't take the bait. I was waiting. I waited like a half second for it. And I was like, nah, he's not going to comment. So I moved on. It didn't work. <laughs> I thought that was a little obscure, but that's okay. <laughs> you're like oh this guy's just weird <laughs> no I, I completely blame that on Justin so you, you can uh, punch him in the arm when you see him uh, next week uh, other answers to your question were change the employees I don't know if that's really a graphic change person think about that uh, Gary Holmes use the metric system for crying out loud uh, all good ideas seriously um, why wouldn't we be using the metric system it's ridiculous um, that's it that does it for our, our chat that's all of it that's all I got. I'm spent. My beer's gone. Vaughn, my beer's gone. And Thanks, that everybody. means we're done. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will talk to you soon. Uh, tweet your Verizon designs to add Vonster. And we're out. <laughs> Ciao.